good afternoon. <laughs> Jesus. <coughs> I'm not any better. <coughs> okay, I'm good. Well, if you took that dick out of your mouth. <laughs> oh, I like this dick. <laughs> you should never perform fellatio and podcast, Adam. You know that. Mm. Doesn't That's ha- for the other podcast. That's for the other one. We tried that last week. It didn't work out. Aww. I missed that one. I was having such a good time. <laughs> are you all right? Is your Are your sinuses cleared? Ugh, What's I'd, the matter with you? I have no idea. I think it, Since I came back from Florida, I've just been a wreck, I think. Yeah, it's, it's been really bad. Well, it was that one timeshare dilemma, and it was all over. No, oh, that timeshare. I don't want to talk about the timeshare dilemma. It's Thank cancer. You. It's cancer. It's not AIDS. <laughs> I thought it could have been AIDS. What's more, who like, knows with you, Nick? <laughs> you missed his timeshare debacle, and I won't recount it as to bore the listener, but I will give you this so you can make fun of Adam. He almost cried <laughs> because he was sold a timeshare. Oh, it was, that triggered him. It was. The most, I mean, you, you were. He's like, you will not believe the vacation I had. <laughs> a pushy salesman made me listen to his pitch about a timeshare, and I didn't buy it, mm. and I almost cried. He spent twenty minutes last week complaining about that shit. Well, it would have been fine if you know we had stuck to the hour and a half time frame that he said he was going to give us, and then it extends for five hours. I, I'm, I'm confused. Did just, you go on a vacation? Yes, I went on a vacation. But we ended and up... why are you complaining? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, thank you. But... <laughs> I'm really trying Tell to wrap my head around. What was the average temperature in degrees Fahrenheit during your vacation? Uh, like 90. Okay, you're in no position to fucking complain. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Did you see the ocean this week? No. Okay. Well, I just want to tell you, I'm excited that I went to the beach for the only time this year. Mm. This dude Last is in week. the middle of bumfuck nowhere. There's no, there's no water man. out there. You could go there's to a, a river. Lake. It's like the Vatican. Go to a la- uh, go kayaking on the river. That's fun. Yeah, I would like to do that. Yeah, kayaking is the shit, man. No, anyway, he but was. You have a great lake. Oh, Not just ooh. a good lake. It's a great lake. It's a great lake. <laughs> Did you ever go to that thing? I don't know if we talked about this on the podcast, but there's like an area by a great lake that's just the fake beach that you were what? telling me about. Yeah, yeah. Michaela's parents went there. They and, called it. What was it? It was um, it was like, uh, I don't remember what it was called, like Coney Island or something, or <laughs> something ridiculous like that. Where they they do have a Coney Island out here. I they actually do. don't think that's what it was. It was um, is it as uh, beautiful sh- as the the Queen's Co- or the Brooklyn Coney Island? <laughs> Of course not. With it's smelly, on a river. With smelly Coney no, this, trash? The Coney, the Coney Island I'm thinking of is on the Ohio River. No, they called it something like the the, the Keys of the Midwest or something. <laughs> Some nonsense like that. Like you That know. should not be a sentence. The Keys like, of no, the Midwest, Nobody's by the way. buying it, right? Like, they have the fake Bahamas of Ohio. Jesus. <laughs> right. <laughs> you gotta like really make yourself feel good, by the way. The, b- the Bahamas of Ohio. Like, you have we nothing out there. We imported sand from Florida. <laughs> what, what is that? What is the Midwest like, like really known? Known for that's like fun corn oh, corn's yeah. pretty fun lots of corn lots of corn <laughs> ever just get lost in a cornfield yeah corn in the cleveland browns i think that's all that is uh that's <laughs> in and that, ohio and that's not that great if you're gonna praise the cleveland browns <laughs> yeah but that's the most you got going on there i drove through it there's nothing there you know i i can very cincinnati's cool but other than that there's nothing there it's too bad yeah nick what are you doing there what <laughs> go to go Am to I doing something that doesn't look right. Was, <laughs> yes, yeah. No, no, no. I'm saying, what are you what are you doing out there in the Midwest? Get out of there, man. He's growing out a beard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I just work a lot. True. Yeah, he wanted to move somewhere where a beard like that looks acceptable. What I like That's is like a it's a city, beard. so there's a lot going on, but it's very isolationist. Sure. Like right, right outside the city, there's nothing. Right. Nothing isolationist. For hours. Like they they refuse to get involved with Iran's problems. That's definitely. <laughs> it's very isolation. Yeah, I haven't Cincinnati. heard any. I haven't heard the Cincinnati mayor say anything about Iran. So, do they even know that Iran exists? Is it that probably kind of not? Place? Pro- okay. Yeah. Um, let's <laughs> let's let's get into this. As as much as I'm enjoying this banter right now, um, nonsense. This is nonsense. <laughs> We just got a compliment last week. It's like, yo, guys, I love the banter at the beginning. Mm. Never change. And I wanted to be like, be careful what you wish for, because Adam and I spent a half hour doing banter last week and like 20 minutes on the movie. Yeah. Well, we got to it, you know, eventually. I've heard mixed messages on that. Some people love the banter. Some people hate the banter. Well, see, what I what I think is that 
we can just take the comments of people who like the banter and just listen to them. That's true. Right. And ignore the other people. Maybe if we started out our podcast every week with our vibrator podcast, we do a vibrator segment. Mm-hmm. Every, everyone loves the vibrator segment. And then, you know, we... I, haven't, I don't know if we have any data on that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? I haven't had the opportunity to test out my new designs, but really? when I get on that, I'll work on it, yeah. I, I have some new rhythms I've been working okay, on. Okay, you got the new yes. rhythms, but I'm not really sure how applicable they are. What, do you think I'm too ambitious? Uh, well, yes, but that's besides the point, I think, <laughs> Adam Hall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um anyway, let's uh let's talk about this movie. It's called Wrong, and boy is it wrong. <laughs> hey oh, hey oh. Uh well, yeah, w- w- what a way to start, Nico. <laughs> you just just dive head in, okay. <laughs> we yeah. should we, are. we should explain mm. that this is a part of a new series that will last exactly 2 weeks. Yep. It's called June de Pew. Yep. I did not know this. Thank you for telling me. I would have been lost. June of Depew. It is June of Depew. Quentin Depew, the director of Rubber, also made this movie wrong. No, that makes sense. I, I did get that sort of feel. Oh, well, me too. <laughs> um, Rubber, though, is much more clear about what it is. Uh, wow. I've never heard that before. What a statement. But yes, I agree. Okay. No, I mean rubber's weird as shit. Don't get me wrong, but but you know what it is. It's it's like kind of yeah. I mean, you know more than this movie. I have no clue what this movie was. Yeah, I would say, and we talked about the thematic stuff last week with rubber, and I thought it was pretty cut and dry. Like, obviously, it's a really stupid movie about a weird thing and weird <laughs> things happen in it. But at the end of the movie, when the tires are rolling away to Hollywood, it's like, oh, this was a. Metaphor about the film industry. Yeah. And this one, I'm not so sure I have one central theme. No. There's, a, there's a couple things that it was certainly nibbling at, and I got it, um, and we'll talk about it. But I'm yes. really sick of every movie that exists just really leaning into the Bible. You thought this was what? biblical too? I, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it had a message biblically. But it just, it pulled from it a lot. Like what? Give me an example. Okay, I wrote down everything, all right? Okay. Oh, oh my God. So, first off, and this is going to be like, okay, Nick, shut up. But this I dude literally has been going got, to way too much Sunday school, by the I way. Know. It's, driving, it's driving me nuts every movie, though. This, okay. They really oh, do God. it. <laughs> all right, go so, ahead. It's like God and penises First in off, every single what are the movie? names of the, the dog? Paul. Oh. The Apostle Paul, right? You have another dog, so? which is actually... Hold on, hold on. I'm, oh. I'm telling you all of the things, okay? All right. There was another dog which actually turned out to be a kid named Joshua. That's another name from the Bible. He had a palm tree, which is from the Bible, but it got replaced with what? A Christmas tree. That's not okay. a palm tree. That's a that's the psalm. You're thinking of the book of Psalm. No, there's a palm tree, too. Look it up, you dick. There's a palm tree in the Bible? Yeah, a psalm is not a palm tree. Those are different things. I know. I thought is... you were confused. There's no. no fucking palm tree in the Bible. What are you talking about? Look it up, bud. All right, I'll look it up. Um, Keep going, Nick. I'll even... Okay, so the pizza place is literally called Jesus Pizza. <laughs> okay. This is fair. This yeah, is fair. Yeah. Literally, dog backwards is God, and the whole movie is about him finding his dog or losing his dog, right? Okay. So finding God or something. And then that guy, um, Master Chang, who writes those books, he literally writes a part one and then a part two, and he tells the guy, oh, ignore the first book. I completely denigrate it. <laughs> That's literally like the second book of the Bible. Okay. The New Testament, completely denigrating the first. And it was raining at his job nonstop. I'm not sure if there was some reference to the flood there or some nonsense, but mm. it just felt like they were really leaning into it. Okay, I didn't get but that. But it made no sense. No. It had no purpose. It just seemed like he was just like, I'll just pull things from the Bible. <laughs> That's just, Why this, not? This entire movie is just, let's do it for, for <laughs> fuck it, essentially. Psalm 92.12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar on Lebanon. There's stuff about palm trees in the Bible. It's it's pretty. It's a it's a theme. I uh, feel like when you think of the Bible, you don't think of palm trees. The though. palm branch is a symbol of victory, triumph, peace, and eternal life, originating in the ancient Near East and Mediterranean world. The palm the was fact sacred. That the palm tree turns into a Christmas tree. I think there's something there about the Bible, but I don't know what I don't know what he's Dying trying to say. Rose again, all that shit. 
I don't know what he's trying to say. I don't. He <laughs> couldn't have. Just, I mean, it's a it's a pine tree. It couldn't have no, just... but they literally mention like he gives it away to the children, and they go, "Hopefully, they'll use it for Christmas." Like they really, <laughs> they they don't avoid it. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, the Old Testament, New Testament thing. I think pushed me over the edge. I think you're right yeah, about that. Yeah, that's the one that really sold me. But I caught on right at the beginning. As soon as it was about a dog, yeah. I was like, you know, you are know. you it, are keenly attuned to these biblical metaphors, though. He's been going to too much church. Yeah, he's been going to a lot of church lately. I haven't been going actually. I haven't gone since. Uh, beginning of april is that right yeah okay well good thing you're watching movies like wrong it makes up yeah. for it yeah that's how i get my my daily uh <laughs> or my <laughs> weekly M- movies love the bible and they love dicks for some reason yeah i don't, I yeah. don't know why that is but every almost every single movie is just infatuated. one or the other right yeah no and i'm not <laughs> you think i'm kidding i think but no, no i'm i'm have, yeah. have you watched the show Euphoria on HBO yet? No. With Zendaya? No. There are so many penises on that show. Oh my it God. is crazy. Are you into that, Nico? No, but uh-huh. there's like, there's many, there's many a penis. At least like 50 penises I've seen so far. Is it a nice balance of penis and vag and or no. boob? No. No. Oh, it, there's, it, a, there's a couple boobs. It steers head, head first into the dick. There's an erect <laughs> dick in Ooh, an episode. An okay. erect penis. Okay. I've never seen an erect like penis on television before. Yeah, I feel like that's... It's on HBO, though, Sunday nights with Zendaya, former Disney star. <laughs> and star of Spider-Man Far From Home. Yes. Let's plug that. She is on Euphoria <laughs> with dicks aplenty. Anyway, Good for her. I just want to bring that up. Good for her, right? Yeah. You know, it's... it's uh, we, it, we all strive to be in a show with a shit ton of dicks. Yeah, it's a natural maturation, I would say. <laughs> All right, I buy that for sure. Um, I'm not sure, like, thematically, though, this movie is about... Oh, it's not at all. No, it's not. (laughs) I feel like... But I feel like there might be a point to pulling shit from the Bible needlessly. Maybe he's trying to make a statement about other people pulling shit from the Bible needlessly in their movies. There's certainly a lot of, like, meta commentary on just, like, cliches in film in this, which is interesting because Rubber is so much about the filmmaking process and picking it apart that it feel like it kind of carries over into this one. But again, share the one that you pointed out at the beginning, the very beginning of the movie, there's a scene where he's talking to his neighbor, Matt, who's across the road. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, you got to come closer. And he's like, why? He's like, cause we can't communicate. And I'm thinking in my head, like, well, yeah, you can communicate cause you clearly are obviously stupid movie, <laughs> but he, then they, they finally block it so that the two are standing right next to each other. And I was just like, oh, OK, interesting. My, my, and my reaction was like, generally speaking in movies, when you block your actors, you have them come very, very close to have a more engaging conversation. Whereas you could have just stood on opposite sides of the road and gotten the same point like some neighbors sometimes do. Right. The movie's just making a comment about how, you know, films ultimately work. So. So I, I'm glad that you actually bring this up because it makes it makes the stupid biblical shit make a lot more sense because i think it's probably a commentary on other films mm-hmm. oh maybe and how they overutilize biblical themes maybe i could see that because a especially because of... it's nonsense biblical well, themes that he's using well right. so much of this film has absolutely no point and i i i, I turned to nico a, a couple times i think and i was just like why are they not like what was the point of that or, or like why didn't they cut that there's a, <laughs> right. scene, there's a scene towards the very end where the cop uh, is about to get on the bus. <laughs> He's just like, I was thinking about getting on this bus, but right as you pulled up to me, I decided not to because I don't like you. And the bus drives on. And I just turned to Nico. I was like, they, they, uh, they couldn't cut that? Right. And you're like, no, needed to be in the movie. That was pivotal. Yeah. <laughs> <to this. laughs> needed to be in the movie, guys. The thing is, though, with a guy like Quentin Depew, who's a madman, mm-hmm. it's like... <laughs> <laughs> In his head, he has an explanation. I'm not sure he could articulate that explanation, but in his own head, it makes perfect sense. Are you saying there's a reason for it? Yes. (laughs) It's a tribute to no reason. That's right. It's funny. I'm looking at this poster, and on IMDb, the first poster that I see is an upside-down image of that car driving through the vastless wasteland, Mm -hmm. and that's also how the movie ends. Yeah. And... I don't know. What does that mean? Clearly that meant something to Quentin Depew. Why was this bit character who was only in three scenes of the movie, his journey through this vastless wasteland of nothingness? What does that say about the theme of the movie? Maybe there's nothing to mine from this movie. 
it means nothing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, or, I think we, we can. I think we might be able to dig deeper into this. Just about making fun of other films and their, um, I don't know, overuse of garbage plot themes. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. I'm trying to. Th- I'm not I'm sure it's think- all that. You don't think it's all that? No, I don't. I don't. We gotta. I, I, let, let's keep digging into this because I'm really not sure. Is my answer right now? So here's my theory. Here's what hit me. This character is trying to live a normal life. As normal, like he, in many points of the movie, like goes out of his way to maintain normalcy. He gets fired from his job, but he continues to go and pretends to work. He loses his dog, and all he wants is that that companionship. This tree, this odd-looking tree in the backyard, suddenly appears, and he does everything in his power to fix that that problem. It's like this dude is trying his absolute best to maintain sanity. But he can't because weird things keep happening to him. Chaos keeps hitting him, Mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of this movie is sort of lampooning our desire to live a normal American life and how absurd the conventions of normal American life are. Going to work at your desk job doing i mean like literally it, the the movie never explains what his job is they never I think explain it's a travel agency whatever's happening it's like you, when you go to your job it's like rain is 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 hammering you it's like it's like you're being just constantly just shit on just terrible weather just pelts down on you all day and you remain impervious to it because you're just doing what you're supposed to do right you go home your wife Claims to be in love with you. She's not actually in love with you. And you're not actually in love with her. But she's trying to keep this this facade going. Yeah. Right? And she's giving birth. Here's this happy family. We live on the beach together. You know, this is sort of mocking. Yeah, but you're forgetting the critical part of like. What? <laughs> well, but it's not like she's his wife and she's trying to maintain a facade. She's a fucking nutcase. Yeah. Yeah. She literally fucks the gardener thinking it's him and she doesn't understand that they're two different people. <laughs> right. Yeah. But no, but it's because she it, this character though has a desire to live the American dream. And the movie is mocking this American dream, I think. I wish it it ex- explained that more like if it's it doesn't go into details to why things are absurd, they just are. Yeah, I can't buy that the American so, dream has anything to do with this film because there's no green light in the distance. And that's the only way I know how to interpret the American dream. <laughs> what are you talking about? Unfortunately. What are you talking about? Did you never read The Great Gatsby? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> that's interesting, yeah. Come on. <laughs> Did you ever read The Great Gatsby? I at my Gatsby. joke, you bitch. <laughs> I read the spark notes of The Great Gatsby. Does that count? There's a green light. It represents the American dream. Okay. Come on. They, they only taught us like three things in school. <clears throat> I, I'm just sort of caught up on this this work environment. That's what pushed it over the edge for me. There's something like very on the nose about a guy that goes to work three months after being fired, attempting to maintain normalcy, and he's in this office with torrential downpour inside. We should explain that for the listeners, by the way. This guy That's worked. That's one of my favorite <laughs> scenes. It was freaking Nico out. Oh, he, it gave me anxiety. I hated it. It was like so. So this guy, um, <laughs> Dolph. So that's the main character's name. He just he walks into work. He's wearing a suit and a tie and a briefcase. And just inside the office, it's just torrential downpour everywhere. And everybody's just working. They're all soaking wet. People are filing papers and the papers are just soaking wet. I got and, the heebie-jeebies, man. Dude, and, that freaked but, me the fuck out. But nobody's reacting. It's no. just like, this is what work is. Right. But, um, what I really liked, though was um, his one co-worker who was just giving him the evil eye the whole time. Because yeah. oh, like, he's just like, like Dolph's just sitting there at his desk not doing anything. And by the way, he, he's only at work for two minutes and then he gets up and leaves. Right, <laughs> right. It's a little weird. Pretends but, to work, by the way. He's not really yeah. doing anything. I love that scene with the guy who's giving him the evil stare. Like at the end yes. of one of those scenes, he just licks the piece of paper. That's my favorite. He's like, ah! he has an envelope it's and it's soaking wet. Everything's raining and he's just staring at Dolph with his evil eye and he just licks the envelope to shut it. It's like, it's like a big manila folder type envelope. It's so funny. And he's just, just the, <laughs> just in the soaking wet room, him giving this evil eye and just licking this piece of paper and shutting it like while staring at him like you bitch. 
<laughs> something about it was just really hilarious. Oh man, I I I uh, I was really freaked out by the idea of laptops getting rained on mm. and papers <laughs> crumpling up. Like that just I hate wet paper. What if they they got what if there's they, nothing I hate more than wet paper? I didn't know paper. you had this anxiety. Oh my god. If it went like Ooh, Nico, what if they came to a, a close up of them trying to write on the wet paper? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and then the graphite is just falling off. It's like the ink? it's beating yeah. on top of the page. The paper's oh. like tearing a bit. And then it's tearing right in the middle, but not enough to like be a clean tear? Uh, that's great. Dude, that doesn't even freak you out? That's like nails on a chalkboard for me. <laughs> Dude. I had no idea you had this anxiety. That's not an anxiety you have? Like spilling coffee no. on your I, work or something? Like I, that freaks no. me out. I understand no, why you have the anxiety, even though I personally don't have Yeah, like such. I get why it's yeah. bothersome, but it doesn't <clears throat> bother me to the degree. Dude, what if it's like an important document? Well, Nico, <laughs> here's the thing. Uh... <laughs> First off, nothing's that important. Let's. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I spilled paper on, or I spilled water on a check once, oh, and it gave me like fucking. It's like that's money. I am destroying money. It's a check. The ink started to bleed on the check. It's I, not money. You I rushed tear home. The- I did that the old uh, the the blow dryer trick. Did I hate it? It's not money. It's a check. No, I still hate you it. You tear though. it up and you just grab a new one. Dude, I hate what I think paper. it was a check someone wrote to him. Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay, that, that is money. Okay, that okay. is literally money, yeah. That's money, yes. Okay. Dude, I hate wet paper. Isn't that weird? A check's only money when it's addressed to you. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just a check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Money is meaningless. Whoa. Yeah. Like, if I wrote the check, I don't care what happens to it. That's, you know? great, that's a great point. Yeah. But if it's written to you, Ooh. shit. Shit, dude. Dude, money's a weird thing to begin with. There's nothing behind it. Not really. Think about that. There's <laughs> nothing behind it other than the American government being like, yeah, that means something. It's arbitrary as hell. There's no gold behind the money anymore. It's just paper that someone said is worth something. And even then, you could argue like gold, like, so what? When you think Great. about it. When you think about it. You could still be like, yeah. Is he freaking you out or what? It's just a metal. <laughs> it's just this thing that's Shit. in the ground. Why is that valuable? Dude, I think this is like the theme of wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Why does anything matter? I think we're nailing it right now. Uh, yeah. No, that scene really freaked me out. But I did love the image of just, you know, downpouring in office. So you know what freaked me out a little bit? Gave me a little bit of anxiety. Not as much as you. But when when this... um. So, at the beginning, after he finds out he lost his dog, we got to talk about this a little bit here. Yeah. Um, he, he gets an ad for a pizza place called Jesus Pizza, and he calls them, and he just speaks to the lady on the phone, and he's like, um, hey, I don't want to order any pizza, but why is, what is up with your logo? She goes, oh, it's a, it's a bunny on a motorcycle. And he goes, why? She goes, well, I assume it symbolizes the speed of the delivery, but I can ask the manager. And he goes, yes, please. So she asks the manager, comes back, and she goes, yeah, I was correct. Um, and he says, but doesn't that just seem odd to you? Like, the motorcycle's overkill. Like, I understand the bunny's fast, but... And then they're, they're having this whole conversation. It's a weird scene. Um, and then at the end of the conversation, this woman's basically just like, I love this conversation. My name's Emma. <laughs> and, um, and then she buys him a pizza, sends him some flowers, and then... Um, accidentally fucks the gardener and moves in with him <laughs> we had to specify that by the way that there is a note in the pizza box that says i really loved our conversa- conversation and i would be uh, perfectly willing to fuck you later or something like that <laughs> is that what it said <laughs> yeah yeah i am dtf <laughs> um and so yeah she just assumes the gardener is dolph and the gardener who doesn't speak english very well just sort of <laughs> goes with it he's like yes i am dolph and he just so I mean it's at the end I want to say he is it is his fault like he, he knows English enough to not say that he is somebody he isn't <laughs> um, what is the nationality of this gardener by the way I'm French. dying to know he's French I don't know if, I don't know what he is okay so he I, is French because he, this is Canadian he's some sort of French Canadian, Canadian probably yeah, but, he, right? he, but he's like clearly playing a Mexican laborer though or he sort of be, he could just be a gardener I mean, it could there are, be, but like his like wardrobe and everything is like it elicits a, le- a Mexican laborer look. What do you mean? He also like he doesn't look like he's a very good gardener. I just want to say that really quick too. He, what was your first clue, Nick? 
<laughs> the way he put the rakes away <laughs> in the back of the truck. That was what really did it for me. I didn't really take him seriously when some random asshole comes and starts painting his car. He doesn't mind at all. He just leaves it. I love that character. That <laughs> I took the liberty of painting your car blue. I'm like, oh, no, thank you. I, I, I very much liked it red. And oh. he doesn't change it back. And he he doesn't leaves. even react to the fact that he's painting it fucking blue. But this is another, like, weird absurdity. It's kind of making fun of, like, why do we care what our cars look like? Like, that's the thing that people, like, people take so much pride in, like, the color of their cars. And, like, but, like, for example, I just had an, uh, an unfortunate incident with my car. And there's a dent in the side. And it's scratched up. And, mm. like, my brother and I are stressing out trying to repaint that dent. And I'm thinking, why? Who am I trying to impress? Also, how old is that car? Uh, it's like 11 years old, something like that. Doesn't have any value anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I'm, no, like for real, like even if you sold that car like tomorrow, you, I wouldn't get anything make, for it. Yeah. You wouldn't get any money for <clears> it. And that car's going to drive forever. You're keeping that thing until it dies. Exactly. So what do I so, care if it has a dent in the well, side or not? Well, let me tell you something, Nico. You shouldn't. So don't, yeah. don't pay to fix it. That's a waste I, of money. I'm with you. If I, if I park my car <laughs> at a target or whatever, and then I go inside and I come out and the car is a different color. I'm going to think my car is stolen. Because <laughs> clearly it's not my car. <laughs> that is great. Yeah, he goes inside later. Dolph co- goes inside and comes out and he finds his car painted by the same guy has now been painted red. I love that. And that he is- just, there's just this great shot of Dolph just like looking out, just being like, where's my car? <laughs> just right in front of him, but red. And that was spray paint, poorly. by the way. It's only with a paintbrush. Yeah, it's like it's very <laughs> obvious. <laughs> it's very streaky. The but, other colors bleeding through. It's like the funniest thing I've seen in well, a long so, time. I forgot to tell you the part that gave me a little bit of anxiety, though. Okay. Is, um, I was leading up to it when Emma decides to move in with him. Oh, this scene is the it, worst. It, it gave me some some mother PTSD. Oh yeah, just a little. When we were watching it, I, I just had a feeling that Nick would hate this scene for that very reason. Because I was like, because I had the same reaction. I'm like, oh, God, if this ever happened to me, I would she lose just, it. She just moves in his home, starts moving shit around, oh, putting her God. stuff. She This is the worst part to me. She takes a poster that he hung on the wall down mm-hmm. and then just starts drilling a hole in the wall. <laughs> oh, fuck her. Like, it's one thing if you want to move in and put your things where there's space. <laughs> but you're right. moving things that I put somewhere. Oh, no. Dude, I hate people that get too comfortable in in my home. It freaks me the fuck out. Like me. Actually, exactly <laughs> like you. <laughs> You're just moving through your shit. Yeah. Taking things. Taking food. Oh, my God. You literally have us all, like, sit in your basement all the time and just go get waters and sodas out of your <laughs> fridge upstairs. What are yeah. you talking about? Just... <laughs> no, but you're right. There is something, though, about, like, the, the, <laughs> the like, the comfort... Yeah, you know what I hate? I hate people that take their shoes off in my house, which I know you two do often. I don't like that shit. Really? Leave Why? your shoes on. Why? You look too comfortable. <laughs> What's Who wrong? are you to take your shoes off? What's wrong with taking... What? It's, it's usually a sign of respect. No, I think it's really fucking creepy. You don't want to bring I, the dirt I, I, from actually, outside inside. I actually hate it. I know that people are trying to do the polite thing. I actually can't stand it. It's worse. It's really... How do you explain this when you invite a girl back on a date or something? <laughs> don't I, take I would your tell her, shoes don't off. take your damn shoes off, girl. <laughs> Leave them on. I don't want you to because all right, first of all, it's uncomfortable for you and it's uncomfortable for me too. What do you mean it's uncomfortable for her? Okay, whenever you go over someone's house yeah. and someone says to you, "Uh, this is a shoe-free environment. I would really appreciate it if you took off your shoes. We're socks only in this house." Are you filled with rage? Because I'm filled with rage. I've never... R- Nobody ever into- says that to me because I take my shoes off. Yeah, I've never encountered house. those people. They don't give a shit. That's been said to me once. Oh, you... F- Sebastian Maniscalco's got that bit about, we have a shoe rack. Could you please put the shoes on the shoe rack? It's like, <laughs> no, dude. Fuck no. Wait, wait, I take my shoes off? What am I, in a gymnasium? What are we... What? My shoes have been moved around constantly by Abby's parents. They don't care. Okay. My point is... It's uncomfortable when someone requests that you take your shoes off, and it's uncomfortable for the person when the guest assumes that they should be taking their shoes off. I get really uncomfortable. We should just calm down and take the shoes off anyway, not give a shit about what they think, because it's not that big of a deal. Dude, you're walking around in some you problem. Dude, you're walking around in some stranger's home in your socks. 
Who knows where, what's been on that floor? Are you listening to this madness? Dude, I, I cannot <laughs> believe you're not on my side on this. This is a you problem. No, I honestly think like the whole ritual. I don't want ritual, you tracking your fucking mud in my house, listen, God damn it! Listen, the whole ritual, <laughs> that the whole rigmarole of taking shoes off in other people's house because it's, it's not a ritual. To be it is no, a ritual. It's not even because and it's, it's polite. It's because there's actual filth on the bottom of your shoes. This is an actual hygienic You want to lick the bottom of my shoe right now, Nico? Dude, keep your shoes clean then, dude. You know what? Fuck you. you. I'm That's taking my shoes off. Shoes are to keep your feet clean dude, oh, from the I'll dirt. <laughs> Half the shoes are off, god damn it. Keep your shoes clean. What am I gonna get shoes for my shoes, you piece of shit? What are you talking about? That's what they do. I'm gonna plop my feet up on the table now. Yeah, this is comfy as fuck. Yeah, shoes fuck are made you. to keep your feet and socks clean so you can take them off when you get places. This That's is nice. For. Look at that. Yeah, look. Look at that. Can you see me in the feed, Nick? Okay, that's pretty disturbing when you do it like that. I'm not gonna lie. I'm starting to I'm starting to switch sides here. All right, all right. All right. When you stick your down. sock up in the air, I'll calm down. There is something. <laughs> I, I'm only gonna say this once because I can't believe you're not on my side oh on my this. God, there is something incredibly intimate about taking your shoes off in someone else's home, and I and I am not a fan of it. I'm saying a foot massage don't mean nothing. I. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> we act like they don't matter, but they do. And that's what's so fucking cool about them. Listen to yourself. <sighs> Marcellus Wallace's wife. <laughs> All right. I'm done with this. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, what about when she hung up the, the wedding photo of her and her husband that she just left in this other guy's home? <laughs> kind of disturbing. <laughs> A little bit. That got me. Um, <laughs> you missed a couple key details from earlier on in the movie. Mm. First of all, the firefighter taking a shit. In the middle of the, uh... <laughs> well, yeah. So that was like I thought that was just trying to be like, oh, we're gonna have a really like edgy, strange sort of opening to the film that'll really draw you in. Right. But really, just every scene in this movie is just a little off. Right. Or more yeah. than a little off. But yeah, it opens up with a firefighter just taking a shit on the street while reading a newspaper. <laughs> While his other firefighters watch, mm. and there's just a van burning in the background, just on fire, and they're yeah. not putting it out. See, I think this movie's, like, creatively weird, though. Like, it's easy to do just, like, weird shit for the sake of it, but this movie comes up with things that I would never would have thought of. And, like, a small example is when um he's ordering the—not talking to the girl over the phone about the pizza, and he asks mm -hmm. the question, does it come in a bag or a box? <laughs> <laughs> how is it presented is like the question what how is it presented how is it is presented? it in a bag she goes no it's in a box yeah it's oh, a weird like one of those pizza boxes with the logo stamped on it <laughs> right. yes sir that's the one right <laughs> well it's what? like kind it's, of dialogue <laughs> it's this weird deconstruction of yeah. things that are normally assumed to be fact mm-hmm and that that's what I always find interesting. You almost have to like look at it from like a child's perspective, like ask Yeah, that's exactly right. Because yeah. I could see a kid ask like like, oh, why is it in a box? Oh, well, why does it have this logo on it? What does that mean? You right. Know, it's like, oh, okay, so Quentin DePew is five years old. Right. But uh, <laughs> no, but I, I think you're onto something there though. Yeah. There is something there is like a childlike wonder with mm. some of these filmmakers, like the most absurd film like I'm talking about like the David Lynch's of the yeah. world and the Quentin DePews of the world. Even the Darren Aronofsky's of the world to a certain extent. They are more willing to ask questions than they are to provide answers. And those are always the filmmakers that I sort of embrace more. Mm -hmm. It's like David Lynch has this image in his head yeah. because he was dreaming one night while taking LSD. <laughs> and he's like, I want to put this on screen. I don't know what it means, but I'm willing to ask the question and then the viewers can come to their own conclusion about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone like, I don't know, Quentin Tarantino has it in his head, I want to say this, and I want to make sure my audience understands it. Okay. So I'm just going to say the thing. Okay. And I kind of like the nuance. I kind of like the gray area. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, you can, you can make a movie that means something without knowing 100% in advance what it's supposed yes. to mean. I agree. You know? There, there, is, there is a sort of gray area between it's just total bullshit put on screen for no reason... And this is 
very meticulous and beat you over the head and purposeful, Mm -hmm. there's some gray area that you can thread. And I think for the most part, this movie threads that. Okay. You know? I agree. So you liked it, I'm getting, Nick. No, I think I did. Yeah. I do think I did. I think we're Um, all sort of in agreement on, like, where we stand. Because I'm like, I'm sort of very much with, yeah, I think I did, maybe. I mean, let me put it this way. Talking to the listeners at home, I would recommend they watch this film. It's it's only 90 minutes, and it's free to watch on your computer right now. Yes. And mm-hmm. it's worth watching. Sure. It's this thing called Tubi. Right. You can T-U-B-I. look it up on justwatch.com and type in wrong, and it'll there'll be a link, and you can right. watch it right there. Yeah. Um, or we'll put a link in the description here, too. Yeah, good idea. But um, it, it's, it's definitely like... When you guys told me we're watching this movie called Wrong, I thought it was going to be just yet another film that was going to make me just feel terrible about myself watching it. <laughs> just something gross or horror or some, some yeah, other crap that I don't want to watch. Yeah, an exploitation movie. It was also like, my right. idea, which is problematic. In a, right. <laughs> everything that I come up with is just... Ugh. But but this movie is not like that. It's not disturbing to watch. It's just no. very... It's a little uncomfortable, but not even in the same way as... It's not so uncomfortable that you have to look away or anything. It's just kind of like, that's a little off. That's, right. You know, it's just like, like unca- Uncanny Valley. Yeah, it was almost. Just about, mm-hmm. The whole movie yeah. is that, though. Like you said, every single scene, there's something going on that just doesn't m- make sense or does not feel right. Right. That's, especially with like certain performances. Like, I do kind of want to well, talk about that Gardner character and how everything. He, well, he dies. <laughs> yeah but then he doesn't but then he's back and, and do they ever talk about I, I i think i missed a part for a split second no he no, say anything no like, you oh didn't. you're not dead no you didn't, right no. no he just sees him and he goes oh hey what's up like i saw you die earlier but you what know ha- i'm not gonna acknowledge that quentin depew's explanation would be like I, yeah we had to kill him but i really missed him so i brought him back <laughs> <laughs> what a great explanation <laughs> We had to kill him. <laughs> this is such a David Lynch move. Oh, yeah. This is something David Lynch, and you'll see it in season three of Twin Peaks. Characters that you thought were dead are just back. That'll happen. Like, David Lynch will do a thing where he's like, <laughs> he's directing a scene, and there's a character in a scene, and it's played by an actor, and the character will be recast in the same scene. So they'll like just be filming someone and they'll cut and then they'll cut back to the character and it's played by a different actor. Ooh, what? But it's the same character. <laughs> oh my like, that's god. That's a thing David Lynch has done. Wow. <laughs> oh my god, I need to watch this the right balls. fucking now. I'm not the sure cojones. he does this in Twin Peaks, but I've seen him do it in previous movies. I don't know. Oh, I don't remember. I think it might have it might have been done in Twin Peaks. I need to watch this. This that's amazing. Yeah. Well, Holy he had the shit. same actor play three different characters, so there's that. Yeah, too. I know. I do know that. Yeah. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> um, but this was such like a David Lynch move to me, where like the the laws of physics and like the laws of mortality, I guess, for lack of a better term, are secondary to the character stuff. Okay. So it was like it's important to him to have this character in this scene say this specific thing, and the fact that he's dead shouldn't get in the way of that. <laughs> so it's important that he dies in order to express that point. No, I just think he happened to be dead, but I but Quentin Depew's well, like Well, it was I important that he died in that earlier scene. Exactly. And it was important that that earlier scene happened first. Precisely. But it's also important that he's in this scene. So Precisely it. right. Precisely yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. narrative logic in here is just simply non-existent. I don't know why I'm even criticizing. I'm not really criticizing it, but I'm just the fact that my mind goes, "Dude, that doesn't make sense" without acknowledging everything that came before right. in this yeah. movie. I think so. Quentin Depew's argument and David Lynch's argument would be it doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense. Okay. It it it's important to me that this character is on the screen saying this specific thing now. So whatever we need to do to do it, we're just going to do it. Okay. You know. But like you said, every scene had something. Even the little things. Did you guys notice the things in the background? Just the little bits. Like hit me. He had, there was a clock that ticks from eleven fifty nine to eleven sixty. Oh. oh no no no! That that was like the first like I love that. Just laugh out loud moment in the film. And I I I remember when we watched it. I had a feeling like oh I wonder if they're gonna. I actually predicted it in my head like they could do that, but they're not gonna. And then they actually do it. And then there's the um when he went to his boss's office when she yeah. um said you're not allowed on the premises. She just had an upside down twenty ten calendar on her desk. Oh, I didn't notice that. I didn't notice that either. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Near the end, um, when the gardener and Emma, 
who he impregnated are on the beach and she suddenly had a child who's now 10 years old Mm -hmm. and (laughs) there's just this outrageous wild jump cut and then he takes a broken wine bottle and stabs her in the stomach i kind of like never touch upon that again that whole scene is just fucked by the way it's just it's just ridiculous especially with the uh uh, reverse shots which it's really weird Dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The whole reverse shot. That's right. They filmed the whole part of him going to the beach backwards for some reason. And I'm not sure like what the reason for that was, but like, yeah, they so he, the guy was like walking to his car from the beach <laughs> in the real shot, but then they just played it back to like I, I don't know. I'm not sure what the effect was. Could there be some be. sort of commentary on like just having a child and what that does to you or something or. I thought so. Something like that. Or are we trying too family? hard here? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we are. I don't think we are. I, I, think, I feel like, though, you don't come up with shit this crazy randomly. I feel like there is something behind it that causes you to connect these nonsense things. I just keep thinking of that scene from Pollock, though, <laughs> which neither of you have from seen. From Pollock? Yeah. The Jackson Pollock movie? I, I, I quoted it. Uh, on on the other podcast okay. recently, where she's just trying to derive something from what he's doing, and he's just like, "I'm just painting, I'm just painting." What do you want me to say? Well, <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, but she's like desperate. She's like almost yelling at him, like, "This has to mean something. You can't just pull from. You can't get uh, nothing from nothing. It always comes from a place." And he just responds with, uh, "Why don't you paint the fucking thing?" And I'm like, oh, "Okay, maybe." <laughs> Here, okay. I love that. Wow. Well, that's a statement. I, I just love the line, I'm just painting. And it's like... No, but he's right. not just painting, though. But, he, but he's not. But painting isn't just painting, is the thing. No. Like, this idea, like, it does derive from something. The question is, where does it derive from? And is... Is it is, conscious? Right. That's the thing. But, that's the issue. But but they don't really give you an answer to that. Almost as if to insinuate, like, may, maybe it isn't coming from... It's just, like, naturally flowing out of him or something. I think that is sort of the dilemma, though, of absurdist art and yeah. absurdist cinema. It's, is the artist aware of what he's making? That's true. And does he know what he's supposed to be saying? And does it matter? Yeah. Like, the question, does it matter that David Lynch knows what he's doing mm-hmm. when he devotes an hour of an episode of Twin Peaks to an atomic bomb explosion? And I don't think there always is a concrete, or there always are concrete answers. I don't always think that the artist does know exactly what they're doing in the moment sometimes. Sure. No. That but, doesn't mean it means nothing. Right. That's very important. Right. I'm not sure, like, knowing what the intention is supposed to be makes art any better or worse. Mm-hmm. Like, if the final product is moving in and of itself, yeah. and if there is content to be derived from the final product, who the hell cares how they got there? Precisely. You know? Yep. So, in this case, I think... Here's how I would put it. Quinn DePew had a very specific point of view on the world before mm-hmm. making this movie. I think the guy is a bit cynical. He's a bit beaten down by the film industry. He kind of has a chip on his shoulder. And he wanted to make a movie about the day in the life of a guy and this is what it turned out looking like. <laughs> and so, again, how we got there, I think it doesn't necessarily derive from meaning as much as it derives from a particular emotion. Yeah, feeling. or Yeah, a particular feeling. I think he just wrote to the feeling. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think this movie works for me, is that it's consistent in that feeling. Yeah, me too. Like, every scene feels off kilter in the same way. Okay. It, it feels a part of the same piece. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a real world that I would maybe want to spend time in, you know? All right. Maybe. I see what you mean. Yeah. We didn't even talk about the actual plot, so to speak. Do we want to? Did we talk about William Fickner at all? Oh, yeah. Because he's the only name in this entire movie. Well, yeah. Is he Master Chang, I'm assuming? Yes. Yes, Master Chang. I recognized him for sure, but I just, I couldn't place where. He was in The Dark Knight. Oh, Oh, yeah, he was. The opening scene. Yeah. You have any idea? Prison Break. Yeah. He's in Prison Break. Yeah. Yeah. That's also true. (laughs) He's in The Longest Yard. Yeah. Okay. He's in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, Armageddon. So, so Dolph loses his dog, and um, that's sort of the whole driving plot, so to speak. Um, and turns out this guy who is a huge pet lover, um, kidnapped his dog to remind him that he loves his dog, <laughs> but not because he stopped loving his dog. He's doing it 
to prevent him from forgetting that he loves his dog. Yeah. By reminding him ahead of time. Distant make, makes the heart grow fonder. Is right. Basically but it turns out that in the process of kidnapping his dog, he lost his dog. So right. he doesn't know how to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> so he hires a private detective to help um, Dolph find his dog. But does he, though? I mean, the ending makes me think that he it was all planned. Well, yeah, but I guess he had a dream of how he would find the dog again, right? No, the dog came on the bus, right? Yeah, yeah but, but he, he dr- Master he, Chang dreamed that ahead of time. Right. And he watches it happen, which makes me think that he had already like like seen this coming or that he had already planned it or something. I actually think there's a psychic connection with the dog. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Well, he wrote about it in his book. Right. And he actually Master accesses that that uh that ESP as well. Dolph does. Okay. Yeah. Later on in the movie. Yeah, I actually think like the dog got back through ESP. Okay. I do. I do like that this is a world where you can talk to dogs like telepathically. That yes. actually really makes me want to be in this world. Right. So this guy, Master Chang, I want to just say right off the bat, what an accent. <laughs> what a choice. <laughs> what a choice by William Fickner. I don't know. It's like some combination of like Middle Eastern, like Chinese, a little bit of Swedish in there. Like, I wasn't really sure what his nationality... I mean, his name is Master Chang, so I would assume he's from Asian descent. But it's not an Asian accent. He's totally... It's... Also, he's totally not Asian. That's like, also true. Yeah, he's just white as fuck. Like, if he, if he was Asian, it would be like a Eastern Russian kind of... <laughs> you know? Right. So, what a choice. This guy, as you said, is like a philanthropist, sort of. Or, or I guess an entrepreneur who started this business. I don't know who's, like, funding this shit. The government. Well, I was waiting for him to um, ask for money for stealing his dog. Being right. like, I have done this service for you, now pay me. Right, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I stole your dog and brought him back. Isn't right. that the plot of a movie? No, that was the plot of a movie we wanted to make. No, it is the plot of a movie. It's uh, no, Seven Psychopaths. Yes! Oh. Yes! Remember, Nico, we were talking about stealing people's dogs and then and returning them, in. them. Yeah. But that's literally Seven Psychopaths. Oh, well, we were talking about doing this years ago, and I never saw that movie. Oh, maybe I got that idea from that movie. <laughs> that is Thief. A, I don't remember who I, I, what I watched first. When did Seven Psychopaths come out? 2011? Oh, yeah, then I probably just stole the idea. <laughs> that's right, Seven Psychopaths. That's the plot of that movie. Yeah, 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 they steal the dog and then return him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's not exactly what this company is. No. This company's just in it for the love. They're a charitable organization. That's tr- Five one C three. But we should say though, the dog went missing after the kidnapper got in a car accident and the car was aflame. That was the vehicle that we saw at the beginning of the movie that the firefighters refused to put out. I would hope right. so anyway. So it all comes full circle. True. Sure. Yeah. Sure it does. <laughs> it would have been funny um, if that was a completely different vehicle though. Had nothing to to do with that. It was just a non sequitur and then There was one scene from this movie that did strike me as a little bit off from the rest of it in its tone. You were talking about how everything was pretty consistent throughout. Mm -hmm. But this one character, I should say, really, maybe it was just the actor, but it felt a lot more like Camp Death than it did like Rubber or the detective. The the detective. I thought the detective's acting was horrendous in this. Oh, God. It, it, It felt like Camp Death. Yeah. That movie we watched a few months back. Yes. Um, it felt like that level of acting. And um, I mean, just him finding the dog. By the way, turd. do not criticize the acting of Catherine Alpin, by the way. Oh, no, no, not, not, no. Do not, was, don't you dare compare the star, the performance of the detective in this <laughs> to the great Meryl Streep lookalike Catherine Alpin, friend <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> uh, we love you, Catherine. Yeah, I love Catherine. Um, I can't wait till they cast Catherine in the prequel to Big Little Lies. She'll be on that show <laughs> playing early Meryl Streep. Oh my god! One of these. The only problem with Catherine's little niche there is that Meryl Streep's daughters look exactly like her. Does do they? Yeah, huh. yeah. But I'm sure one of these days Catherine's going to be cast as like a young Meryl Streep in the origin story. Well, she just has to be a better actress than Meryl Streep's daughters. That's not a lot of competition. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> what if can't... Meryl Streep's daughters are just shit? They're just awful, awful actresses. They're not actually no. The one's not bad. The one they made that movie Ricky and the Flash. Remember that movie? Oh yeah. She like plays the rock star and the in the um. 
Wiki. What? In the Flash. I did Mammy not see Gummer. That. Yeah, she was in True Detective and shit. What's her name? Mamie Gummer. Meryl Streep's daughter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, her husband's last name is Gummer. What a terrible name. Dude, I love the name Gummer. I don't. Okay. <laughs> um No, so so like, I mean, they have the scene where he he finds um Dolph's dog Paul's shit and <laughs> he um is able to access the shit's memories and turn it into a VHS tape. <laughs> and it, it, you can tell that they literally just bought a VHS tape of like one of those cameras you stick in somebody's colon. Yep. Right? Yep. And so he's just showing this like really shitty black and white footage on an old VCR of just like a camera moving through somebody's colon and he's like that's your dog's shit in its body. We're accessing its memories. Yeah. That whole scene felt like um, Camp Death. It didn't really feel like it fit in this movie. Right. Even his performance at the end where he hits him with the chair too. Yeah. For no good reason. Yeah, that guy sucked. Well, he it seemed like he was ad-libbing a lot of the dialogue too. And it's like, why? Yeah. Why'd you let this guy improvise? He's like terrible at it. I don't know. Yeah, that, that felt off to me for sure. Maybe they just like didn't get the take that they wanted. Maybe that was like the first take, but the second take, like the, the footage got corrupted or something and they couldn't use it. <laughs> How do you screw up a movie like this in that way, though? It's funny. <laughs> they couldn't get. They couldn't afford reshoots. Like even you were too bad for this movie, right? Well, that's like yeah. That's that is the weird thing that there is like something that starkly stands out as just very poor mm-hmm. compared to the rest of this nonsense. Well, it shows that there's actually something to this movie, though. Yeah, when there is like a, that's... a consistency, like we were talking about yeah. throughout. I'm starting to yeah, appreciate this movie the more we talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> the first, by the way, I, I have to say the first time I ever saw like any anything about this movie was uh, was from a professor, really over in England. And oh, um, that makes sense. I went into because I had to talk about uh, what I was supposed to do on a certain project, and they have this massive like five by three poster of Wrong. What? It's like their favorite movie. What? And they're like 40 years old. I'm like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's it's just this new French film or something. I'm like, what do you, what? And then I looked into it and I figured out it was by the guy who made uh, um, uh, Rubber. And I'm just like, I, I, I didn't know that film professors actually gave a shit about this guy. Wow. Dude, I appreciate this dude, man. This might be one of my next guys. Depew? Yeah. Quentin Depew. I'm into it for He's sure. just so French, you know? Mm. So I guess let's let's just let's jump right to the end then. This this sounds like as good a place as any. Oh oh man, one more thing I wanted to mention. So at one point, this was like the scariest part of the movie for me. Like freak oh, me God. out. <laughs> when Master Chang was like, "I need you to do me a favor, Dolph. I need you to take care of one of these dogs that we accidentally kidnapped." Smash cut to a little boy with creepy glasses. And that like weird stinger sound effect that always plays in horror movies. Mm-hmm. And that just like gave me the goosebumps. <laughs> they accidentally kidnapped a child and now they wanted Dolph to take care of this child. <laughs> yeah. It was creepy. I see what Adult, you mean. And, and, and <laughs> what was it? Like um, D- Dolph was like, do I have to or something? And he's like, you always have a choice. And Dolph's yeah. like. Then the choice is no. <laughs> uh, and then, um, yeah, because he doesn't take the child home with him, uh, Master Chang uh, cancels his uh, services with the detective to help find his dog. Right. Weird shit, man. Yeah, that was a freaky scene. But again, I thought that was kind of, and again, maybe I'm stretching, but I don't think I am. The obligations that we have to our to like raise a child and like the the just like weird sense of responsibility and chivalry we have as members of a functioning society and as adult men to be like we must spread our seed and have children and you know live a domesticated life and it's like why man okay why not just march to the beat of your own drum Possibly. I think that's Quentin Depew's outlook at least this guy is such a cynical fuck then. yeah I think he's a bit of a nonconformist Jesus guy, for sure. All right, I can. I guess I can get behind that. Yeah, loved the scene on the beach. As I said, I'm not really sure what they were going for, but that was just tremendously creepy and eerie and awesome. So weird. I want to see this guy make an actual horror movie. That'd be nice. Yeah, I, yeah, for sure. We just got to give him a budget. That's the only problem. <laughs> I'm not sure he could without being cynical the whole time. 
You could be cynical if you want to make a horror film. That's fine. I don't but know. You mean like cynical and funny and weird? Yeah, like I don't think he could actually like legitimately scare people. All right. Right. Yeah, I think I he would like just go for the weird more than the, the thrilling. The possibly. parts that are legitimately scary in these films, I think, are more by accident. Right. True. Yeah. Because I would, I, I, it didn't seem like that scene was necessarily going for a scare. It just so happened to be that way. True. But and it was rub- disturbing. Yeah, yeah. Rubber is also. I mean, its premise is that of a horror movie. It's True. like a classic slasher movie in concept, but mm-hmm. just in execution, it's a straight comedy. Yeah. I just don't think he can help himself. He just likes comedies and Maybe. likes weird offbeat shit. I love this guy, though. I support him 100%. And then so, yes, there's the re- reunion with the dog and everything's back to normal. And then he gets on the phone with his neighbor mm-hmm. who has just driven out into the desert for days upon days upon days. And the movie ends with this scene. And so I come back to the question, what the hell is that supposed to mean? <sighs> I'm, I'm going to be that asshole again, but I I think it could go back into biblical nonsense. Oh, boy. What do you think? Well, you know, just like wandering the desert. Yeah, for no reason. For days. Mm-hmm. Like the Jews well, and, and he calls him and he's like, oh, I found my dog. And it's like almost like he's calling him to say like, I found God because dog backwards again. Okay. maybe. And maybe. this guy's still looking, just wandering the desert. But I don't really get it. <laughs> uh... Guys, we have to sit on it. We have to go to sleep tonight and come back tomorrow morning and get I already slept last night. I watched it last <laughs> oh, night. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm still lost. All right, all right. Yeah, I need to sleep on it as well. Yeah, because I really don't know either. I, I, can't, I can't confidently say it's biblical. I think you're right. I don't think it is, yeah. but... Yeah. Well, stay tuned next week when we finally get to the bottom of the, uh, the desert metaphor. Maybe we could get <sighs> Quentin on. You think? Maybe. 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 Does he have a Twitter? I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, you know, I, I, I'll tell you why. I actually found this last week. Because he's also like a experimental techno artist. Mm. Turns out. He makes a lot of like weird music. Yeah, he did the music for this. Yeah, he also edited it and uh, did the cinematography, too. How much do you think we'd have to pay him to make a theme song for us? <laughs> oh. Ooh, I love it. He, he, he'll work for scale yeah help yeah. us out help us with our weird thing for scale oh my god <laughs> we'll give you one percent of everything we make i hope we've been pronouncing his name correctly <laughs> at oizo 3000 okay of course it is quentin depew aka mr oizo o-i-z-o mr oizo, oizo. he's got two hundred nine thousand twitter followers wow <laughs> wow incredible and he just put out a new movie called reality are we doing a three week? Uh, we may oh. have to. We may have. I to. mean, I'm curious. Wait, is it when did it come out? Last year? Um, no, I think this year. Wow, I think it's a 2019 movie. Holy crap! oizo 3000com Let's see what this guy's all about here. <laughs> Oizo, Mr. Oizo's amazing website. Oh my god, what a website! Oh, this is incredible. What do you mean? You can't hear any of this, right? So it's like. It's just a still image of like an old like 50s computer. And you have like that old cursor, like the 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 eight bit cursor <laughs> on top of this. Oh, I'm like, here. oh this is amazing. Download oh, Rhyme Flat EP. Let's look at his discography. Oh god, this is bizarre. <laughs> and there's all of his experimental music oh, man. all right yeah check it out oizo 3000.com o-i-z-o we are really plugging the shit out of mr depew over it's here it's june depew man yeah. june depew when we commit we commit all right let's play a game Who the hell are we doing? The I guess we got to do Mr. Fickner, don't we? Mm. Yes. Is he the only one we can do, I guess? Yeah. I mean, we can't do Mr. Oizo. <laughs> 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 yeah, let's do William Fickner. By the way, last week I made the executive decision, Nick. Uh, the suspension has been lifted for Adam Hall. I think mm. I think that's about time. Yeah, he's back in. Yeah. I could see why you did it last week. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> true. 
<laughs> you definitely needed another player. Yeah, me playing this stupid game by myself doesn't have the exact uh, same pull. All right. So who's uh, calling it now? Is it back to you? Yeah, I will. All right, all right. Yeah, I'm taking back the reins as game show host. My rightful place. All right, William Fickner. The net worth in Drew Carey's, gentlemen. All right, William Fickner. Star of many movies. I'll give you an exact number in just a second here. A total of... Oh, only 84 credits on IMDb. Okay. Still quite a bit mm. for a short career. Most recently appeared in 51 episodes of Mom, the sitcom. Oh, just had a great episode of Veep. That's right. He was in Veep. Oh, wow. Okay. I think I have a number. Character actor. Well-known character actor. Independence Day. Who's he in Independence Day? Or Independence Day Resurgence, I should uh, say. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was Sorry, the second y'all. one. That, that other movie. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's right. He played the is bad guy turtle? in there. Oh, he played Shredder. Oh, Shredder. Shredder. Yeah. That's yeah. why I recognize him. From, no, I'm just kidding. Fucking weird. I, I didn't see that movie. Most underrated movie of all time. Elysium. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> Dark Knight. You know the job. Uh, go ahead, Adam. What's your guess? 16.5. So like 10 million. Maybe, okay. a, maybe a little high. Okay. 16.5. Drew Carey's. Drew Carey's. Or the other way. Or yeah. Fickner's to get to Drew Carey. Mm-hmm. Nick- what do you think, Nico? I'm g- <laughs> You asshole. I'm gonna go... With uh, 80? 80, 80 thickeners to get to one Drew. What do you what? That's about two million dollars. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no. eighty thickeners to get to a Drew. He's worth more than that. Come. I wanted on. to know what you'd guess because I was stuck between saying one hundred and sixty-five or three hundred and thirty. Oh. <laughs> so I'm gonna say one hundred and sixty-five. Okay, say it oh, about so, one million dollars. So I was being way too generous. With well, that. we'll see. I don't know. Adam, I don't know shit. Uh, no, these are good educated guesses, though, from what you just heard, based on his I'm probably, credits. I'm probably a little low. You're probably a little high. My guess is Nico's probably taking this one. Okay, here he's, we go. Watch, he's worth as much as Seinfeld. The actual... <laughs> no, with Drew Carey's worth a lot. <laughs> he's worth too much. The actual net worth of famed character actor William Fickner is... Eight million dollars, Adam. You just won this week's edition of. Good job. How many? Drew Carey. Take that, fuckers. I'm back. We let him back into the game. Right? I just want to be sure. I'm going to show you my history. And all I really do not want to see your browser history. I'm going to show you. That is the last thing I want to see. Browser history. Just porn, 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 porn. Yeah. All right. It's just porn, guys. Okay. Tons and tons of porn. Actually, no, it's just this. Mr. Oizo. <laughs> Mr. Oizo. <laughs> AKA porn. <laughs> Yo, he could do porn. I think he could do porn. Can you imagine a porn directed by this guy? I would love that. That would be That'd amazing. Be wild. We should we should tweet at him, put the bug in his head. Have you ever considered porn? Mr. Oizo has quite a Spotify following. What? His most popular song has 9,600,000 plays. Wow. 282,000 monthly listeners. That's Jeez, pretty good. That's really good. That's probably where he makes his cash. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder how much he he's worth. He all of his mo- movies through his, There's music. his weird music. That'd be interesting. Mm. Um. All right. I think we're done. Anything else, gentlemen? All squared away. We'll see okay. you next week. I think we're okay. Cool. We're good. We'll be back in July. Oh, man. It's July, right? Oh, yeah. By the way, I have been given an address to contact Zach Caponegro. I will be sending a letter shortly because I need an update. So hopefully we will read that on the podcast. Oh, my sometime God. Sometime soon. I forgot about Zach. I didn't even know he existed. Yes. <laughs> I have an address and we'll see where it leads. But here's the thing, though. Like, the military screens all of the letters that they get. Yeah, I know. So can't write anything like like, like isis in there isis <laughs> damn it <laughs> oh what a shame so hopefully we'll be hearing from zach sometime it's ice ice baby too <laughs> oh my god we just do the entire <laughs> just all the lyrics to ice ice baby <laughs> for no good reason so 
Um, but yeah, in the meantime, we have, um, I think, a couple of new podcasts, actually. Debuting this we'd... week? Yeah, I think so. I think Whoa, we have two we have new podcasts? brand new podcasts debuting what? this week. Well, this is a thing that week. we should definitely announce. Yeah, what? this is a thing that's happening, isn't this it? This is big. Yeah. Do we know yeah, if the so... other podcast was recorded yet? I don't know if it was recorded yet. I believe it's either today or tomorrow yeah. recording. Okay. I don't know about this one. They don't tell me anything, guys. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so we have, um, obviously, the Fantasy Book of the Month podcast, which we talked about last week or two weeks ago, rather. <laughs> F-bomb. Um, we'll be premiering this week. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. And um, a, a friend of ours who, who wanted to start a podcast will actually be uh, debuting on too many Um so keep your eyes peeled for that. That one is called Get Blurted. Um, it's going to be about... <laughs> I didn't even hear this yet. Yeah. <laughs> What's it about? Um, Get Blurted. I, I believe... I Now, don't quote me on this, but I think it's sort of like an acronym for like black nerd kind of thing. So it's that sort of oh. culture. It's like a video game culture, um, tech culture, stuff like that. So I think he's going to be talking about E3, the recent gaming convention. Got it. Uh, so, ooh. Um, ooh. And he's... He's doing these in video format through like Twitch, so there will be a video on our YouTube. You can check it out there. It'll also be audio format. So um, keep your eyes peeled for all that. We got a lot going on. Get blurted. Nice. I didn't know about this. I would love to talk about E3 announcements and shit well, like that. I better that. hop on that podcast. Wow. I'll just... I think he is having guests on, so hmm. I think his go. format is it's just him, but he's having guests call in when they want to kind of thing. Got it. We so. just ta- we just talk about like two things though. I could only talk about like two things, but I could be very passionate about said two things. Mm. So. <laughs> so yeah, keep your eyes out for that. We're really excited. Um, I'm trying to remember his, his name's Malik, but I'm trying to remember his um, his like online name. I think it's FP Malco or something like that. Is that what he's going for? I think so. Most people call him Malco now. So Malco. Yeah, that's like his online Twitch name and everything. So keep your eyes peeled for that, guys. All right. Cool. All right. That's on the website. Too many thoughts media.com or tmt.media for short. Until next time, let's play ourselves out to the dulcet tones of Mr. Oizo. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> and I will, of course, say, as always, you have been so naughty. Naughty. naughty.